1977. Jimmy Carter was sworn in as President of the United States. Elvis left the building for the last time. This jingle for Dr. Pepper would get stuck in our heads for eternity. I'm a pepper, he's a pepper, she's a pepper, we're a pepper, wouldn't you like to be a pepper too? Disco Fever took the nation by storm. A young Aaron Newcomb was just turning four years old. And the love boat set sail for the first time. Families Christy McNichols and Soap's Richard Mulligan sail on the love boat. Right after Starsky and Hutch. But for geeks of all ages, this year holds special significance as Star Wars hit theaters and became one of the longest lasting science fiction franchises. Voyager 1 and 2 launched to the outer planets and beyond. Atari launched the VCS, later known as the 2600, bringing joy to kids around the world. The space shuttle made its first manned flight on the back of a 747 airliner. And three devices hit the market that would become for many of us our first introduction to the world of personal computers. One of these was the TRS-80 from Tandy Radio Shack. Let's look at the history of the TRS-80 and see if any of my TRS-80 equipment is still working after all these years. It's coming up right now on the Retro Hack Shack. In the mid-1970s, personal computers sold as a kit, like the MITS Altair 8800, were starting to really take off, and hobbyists like Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, and many others were designing computers of their own. Don French, a Tandy employee who had previously purchased an Altair, began designing his own computer as well. He shared his concept for a 16-bit computer with John Roach, then Tandy's VP of Manufacturing, and Roach thought the idea had promise, but they needed help. Tandy was able to poach Homebrew Computer Club member and Bite Shop Moonlighter Steve Leininger away from National Semiconductor and he moved to Texas and joined the project in 1976. Instead of a kit computer, Steve suggested that consumers would want something pre-assembled that would be easier to use. Despite some fierce internal skepticism about the viability of selling personal computers, French and Leininger received approval for the project in December 1976, but were told to focus on cost savings. They largely succeeded with the development cost of the system only costing about $150,000. The TRS-80 was officially announced on August 3rd, 1977, and showed up a few days later at Boston University's Personal Computer Fair. It came with 4K of memory and was priced at $399 for just the computer, or more likely $599 with a 12-inch monitor and tape recorder. Radio Shack used Space Age technology to create a compact computer for home and business. The TRS-80 microcomputer system. Record this much paperwork and more, all on inexpensive cassette tapes. Compute budgets, taxes, investments, payrolls, inventory. Ideal for home or business. It's easy to use, and Radio Shack makes it affordable. Under $600, the TRS-80 compact computer, only at Radio Shack. Attend the company. Tandy initially projected to sell only 3,000 units in the first year, but by the time the year was over, they had sold over 55,000. Radio Shack literally could not keep them on the shelf, with some people having to wait more than two months to take delivery from the time they placed an order. The TRS-80 joined the Apple II and the Commodore PET as the 1977 Trinity, as Byte later referred to them, noting that in the same year, these three companies brought ready-to-run personal computers to the world. Radio Shack's extensive retail network and manufacturing facilities, combined with the lower cost of the TRS-80, played a pivotal role in its success. In fact, the TRS-80 was the best-selling PC line outselling the Apple II series by a factor of five, according to Time magazine. The TRS part of the name comes from the combination of Tandy Radio Shack, and 80 is from the use of the Zilog Z80 processor in the computer. However, because of that cost-cutting that was done during development, the name Trash 80 was often associated with the computer as it did need frequent attention. In July of 1983, Jerry Pornell wrote in Byte magazine, I genuinely thought that the Model 1 was the machine of the future, an inexpensive home computer that could be expanded by stages until it would do professional work. Of course, it was never that. 
It had never been all that well designed, and when sales took off much faster than anticipated, the quality control system couldn't cope. Following the original Model 1 and its direct descendants, the TRS-80 name lived on in other computer lines sold by Tandy as well, including the TRS-80 Model 2000, the TRS-80 Model 100, the TRS-80 Color Computer, and the TRS-80 Pocket Computer. But eventually, Tandy recognized that Radio Shack was associated more with the consumer market. They wanted to sell IBM PC-compatible computers in the more lucrative business market, so they decided to drop Radio Shack from the name and just go with Tandy instead. For example, this is why we got the Tandy 1000 instead of the TRS 1000. As far as software is concerned, Steve Leininger wrote a limited BASIC interpreter based on TinyBASIC, which was shipped with the system and became known as Level 1. Soon after release, Tandy contracted Bill Gates at Microsoft to write a more complete BASIC they would license and call Level 2, which could be added to the system as an upgrade with a PCB daughter board. Early programs written in Level 1 BASIC would have to be upgraded by use of a special translation program so they could be used in Level 2. A cassette with blackjack and backgammon games was also shipped with the system, and many other applications and games were developed for the TRS-80 over the years, which I'll take a closer look at in an upcoming episode. The TRS-80, born from Tandy Radio Shack's ambition, transformed the company's image and positioned it as a key player in the emerging personal computer industry. Despite internal skepticism, the TRS-80's success was marked with rapid sales and a significant impact on the world of computing. And if you want to have an impact on the world of computing, you can start with today's sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay offers inexpensive PCB manufacturing and a whole lot more. Need assembly services? No problem. They can do front side, back side, through hole components, you name it. They also offer 3D printing, CNC milling, and more. So check out PCBWay for your next project, and I thank them for their support of the Retro Hack Shack. Now that the history is out of the way, uh, we need to talk about what's on the table right here. So over the past oh, six months or so, I acquired uh, w one of these systems and a little bit of gear, and then I found some at eWaste as well. And so this is what I'm gonna be taking a look at uh, throughout the rest of this video and also probably in some subsequent videos because there's so much here to test and probably to repair. And it starts with these three monitors right here, as you can see. These monitors are the ones that would have been sold with the TRS-80 Model 1. And so I'm really fortunate to have three. We'll see if any of them actually still work. I'll be surprised if there's not some repairs needed here. In fact, I bought an isolation transformer, which is important. I'll tell you why in a little bit. And a Variac, which I probably should have had before now since I do so much work on CRTs, which can be quite dangerous. In addition to that, we've got two Model 1s, and they're a little bit different. We'll look a little bit more closely at those in a little bit. I've got these two disk drives here, but I think I have between four and six disk drives to test out and see if I can get working as well. There's also the expansion uh, units, which are down here. I've got two of those. That's what you would have used to connect the disks to the uh, TRS-80 Model 1s. And I have a bunch of accessories as well, and some software. So there's some tapes here uh, that uh, came with one of these systems, so I'm anxious to see what's on those because some of those contain homegrown applications or maybe programs that somebody typed in off of a book like this. I used plenty of games like this to type in programs, not on the Model 1, but on the color computer with my friends uh, back when we were young. And it took forever. You make one mistake, the program doesn't run. Uh, but there is a, a, a book here full of programs as well as manuals for the TRS-80 Model 1. Now, I wish I could say that I could just plug these in and power them up and see if they work. And some people do do that. But I like to take my time and take a little bit more of a methodical approach to make sure that things are working because you could plug in a bad power supply, for example, to one of these things. And, you know, even if it was a working system, you could short out the whole thing or fry the processor or, or perhaps some memory. So you need to be a little bit careful and take a more methodical approach. And I'll detail that as we go through and take a look at each of these units. Hopefully some of them are working and we can get something powered up so we can see what this would have looked like. And I'm going to start that process with these three monitors. 
So before I start testing these monitors, I just want to go over a couple of things I found in doing my research and in just in looking at the logistics of what I'm about to do here. And I should have mentioned in my history that these monitors are actually RCA televisions uh, that had the tuners stripped out and had some plates put on, similar to this one here. I want to be able to test these monitors separately from the computer so that there's no guesswork as to whether the monitor is at fault or the Model 1 is at fault when I get everything connected. Uh, testing these first will, separate from the Model 1, will actually really help try to diagnose any issues when I know I'm working with a good known computer to begin with. The other one is that uh, just like everything else it seems like on the Model 1, uh, the monitor is connected with a 5-pin DIN. Not only that, because it's the same as the power pin, same as the cassette pin, so you can easily mix things up and blow things up inside the Model 1. The 5 pin DIN has not only composite and ground on it, but it also has 5 volts coming off of the Model 1 into the monitor. The reason is because this is a hot chassis monitor, which means that the chassis inside is actually connected to neutral not necessarily to ground. So if you were to reverse the polarity on a two-pronged out outlet, you could very easily have hot running into the chassis. And when you went in to work on it, uh, you could easily create a short through yourself and uh, get get a really nasty shock directly from, uh, er, from the uh, mains. So you need to be really careful with that. But what that means is that in terms of the uh, connection to the computer, they put in a octocoupler, which separates the ground from the chassis uh, from the ground on the Model 1. Optocoupler, optocoupler, not octocoupler, optocoupler. Ooh, man, this is going to be tough. So that's why there's 5 volts coming from the computer to the monitor, because that 5 volts feeds the optocoupler and uh, gets that chip, provides power for that chip to work. So what I did was I looked for a system in my collection that would have easy access, not only to composite and ground, of course, but also that five volts on the computer without me having to necessarily take everything apart and look around for five volts on the motherboard. Uh, and so what I did was I chose this Apple IIc. The Apple IIc has a composite video output and it also has two volts back here, or sorry, five volts back here on the mouse slash joystick port. So I can use that five volts as long as the optocoupler doesn't require more than 100 milliamps. I don't think it does. I should be able to use that five volts here and send that through the cable back to the monitor and get everything to work and display a similar signal, which is the monochrome output of the Apple II, in this case, the Apple IIc. So that was the first challenge, is picking a system and figuring out how I was going to send 5 volts back to the monitor. The other problem I ran into was, um, not all of them, but this one has a thicker plastic shield on the 5-pin DIN. So uh, the other ones that I have, at least one of the other ones I have, has a metal shield, which is fine. This one has a plastic shield. It does fit into the port on the Model 1, but it does not fit into a standard female uh, jack that you might get. Like I had this one, you know, with the one with the little boot on it and the little shielding. Um, and you can build your own connector that way and hook things up the way you want. It would not fit into this because of this thicker plastic shielding on this 5-pin DIN. So what I did was I broke down my little DIY connector here. The only one I could find was an 8-pin DIN, but that's okay. We're just going to be using the 5 pins that are here. But this should slide right into place on this. There it goes. So I'm just using the 5 pins here. The other ones aren't connected to anything. I looked at the pin out, and I connected my 5-volt my composite signal, and my ground. And then for the mouse, what I've done is I've hooked up a little cable, and I'm using one of these little breakout boards for so I can know which pin to connect the, uh, the 5 volts to, because I definitely want to connect that to pin 2 on the mouse connector. Uh, that will provide me the 5 volts. So by connecting composite, ground, and then 5 volts that way, should give me a good test platform. So with all that being said, it's time to remove the cover and give this thing its first power up in who knows how long. Wow, it's in pretty good shape. There's a few little scuff marks, as you might imagine, but uh, 
yeah, overall this monitor looks pretty good. So the first thing I want to do is just plug it in, see if it even powers up, if it looks like it's got any life in it at all. Okay, the monitor's plugged in. Let's turn it on and see what happens. Oh, that's a great sign. I didn't see anything at first. I was just about to break out my spectrometer here to see if I could see the... Uh, um, the frequency that this was running at, but that is a really good signal there. Oh yeah, look at that. Okay. Little, little sticky pot there. Little, little, uh, crusty. But we can work that off or maybe put some deoxid on it, on the brightness. Contrast is working. Okay, looking good. Almost forgot to put a disc in. This should be Oregon Trail. We'll see. Yep. Apple 2C. Oregon Trail, nice. So, yeah, the brightness is pretty low, but that doesn't surprise me. There it is, the Oregon Trail. Okay, here's the horizontal position. Ooh, there's a little weird deflection going on there. So we'll have to see. That's about as good as I can get it, unfortunately. I think this other control is the vertical sync. Yep, it is. So yeah, that's about as good as we can get it. Uh, unfortunately, the brightness is turned up all the way. Like I said, maybe, maybe a little bit of deoxid on that pot would help. Or maybe there's a brightness control inside because, you know, this is a pretty old CRT, so it's going to be worn out a bit. Ultimately, I don't know how it looks on screen to you guys, but ultimately this should be... You, sh you know, you shouldn't really be seeing the uh, uh, the gray color on the screen. You should be able to get that down to to black. But when I turn it down to black, it's it's really dim. So let's see if I can get anything else on the screen. There we go. Maybe that gives you another another view there. But uh, yeah, so far so far this one's working. I'm going to put a label on this that says monitor number one working okay, low brightness. Okay, here's monitor number two. Let's take the cover off and see what this looks like. A few more scuffs on the top here than the other one. Uh, but yeah, nice and clean, no dust because the dust cover's been on here. So that's really nice. And this one, I don't know if it was a later model or an earlier model, but this one has the regular thin metal shielding around the video connector, unlike that plastic one we had before. So yeah, I don't see anything else outstanding about it. Let me just plug it in and we'll see what we get. Oh, okay, this one's got some issues. This one's got some issues for sure. So you can see the there's something wrong. I mean, it's almost like maybe the the uh, deflection coil or something has slipped off, slipped back or something because I think this should fill the whole screen or maybe on this model it doesn't. Uh I don't know. So let's go ahead and turn on and see if we get anything on the screen here when I turn on the Apple IIc. Ooh, yeah, it's out of focus, way out of focus. So, hey, I get something. I mean, you know, that's better than nothing. And it seems like it is getting a bit brighter as I leave it on. But yeah, there's, there's, there's something out of whack here for sure. Um, I would say this one is maybe even a little bit brighter than the other one, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely out of whack, and I can smell the. It doesn't smell bad. It smells like dust, old old electronics. It smells like dust burning off, you know, some hot regulators or uh, uh, transistors or something. So, but otherwise, I mean, it does it does come on, it does power on, but the the geometry is. Oh, wait a second. It's fixing itself as we speak. I swear I didn't do anything. Maybe things are just kind of burning in. Capacitors are reforming. Yeah, it's not perfect. There's a line that goes across the top here. Um, but maybe that, maybe you just need to, to burn this bad boy in for a little bit because it was in that box, as you saw, with some weird lines going across, but now it's okay. I'm going to call this good. I'm going to say it's okay. So monitor number two, 
Could be a little brighter, but not by much. All right, so this is monitor number three, and this one looks a little bit different. It has this uh, different color gray up here, kind of a two-tone, like this is painted and this, well, I guess they're both painted, but this, this looks a little bit different. The back looks a little bit different. And then down here, it says manufactured November 1978. So I checked the other two monitors. Monitor number one was manufactured in 1979, I believe, and monitor number two was in 80, or maybe the other way around, I don't know. But So we have a set that was made in 78, a set that was made in 79, and a set that was made in 80. And this one does definitely look a little bit different. The front of this set looks pretty much the same. It did not have a cover, so there's quite a bit of dust on here. Ooh. And... Um, the knobs have a little bit of knurling on them, if you know what that is. So that's the only difference that I can see, really. You know, slight differences here and there. Uh, but otherwise, still a modified TV set. So let's go ahead and turn this on, see if anything blows up. The screen came on nicely. Oh, yeah, this one's got more more contrast in it for sure. The brightness is not working. The brightness knob does nothing. So that definitely has to be fixed. Let's go ahead and turn on the Apple IIc and see what we get. Ooh. Oh, there we go. It was the horizontal that was off. And yeah, there we go. That looks pretty good. Yeah. There is a little bit of brightness there. I, I take it back. Or maybe the contrast and brightness are... Oh, that's what it is. I think the contrast and brightness are are skipped on this one, or, or uh, reversed on this one. Huh. So now I've got the brightness all the way up. Set the contrast down. This one definitely has the best, I would say, brightness. This will probably get better as I let it burn in a little bit and warm up. But yeah, that looks pretty good. So three good TR-80 monitors, TR-80 Model 1 monitors. It's weird to say the Model 1 because these only came with Model 1, so they only ever say TR-80 because when these, when these came out, there was no Model 2, 3, 4 or anything. So yeah, this is looking great. Three good working monitors. Yay! All right, well, I'm getting pretty tired, so I think it's time to hit the hay for tonight. But before I do, I want to test the power supplies because I can't actually test the computers without having a good power supply. This is a normal power supply. It looks pretty good. It's a little dusty, but it's in good shape. The connector here is that same plastic shrouded connector that I talked about with the monitors. It has this little thing that kind of pulls back so that when you... I believe it's when, when you put it in the socket, it kind of locks in place. And then when you go to pull it out, I don't know, maybe, maybe when you pull that out, it releases something or I don't know. I don't know. But this uh, plastic shrouded one looks to be in good shape. By contrast, the other one I have is obviously not in good shape. It is held together with tape. It looks like someone took a Dremel to this. I don't know if they tried to replace the guts or what they did, but... Yeah, it's uh, it's not working out too well here. And also, on this one, someone completely removed the shroud, and all we're left with is the pins exposed here. So someone must have got frustrated with this or something, ripped it off or broke it off, and now all that's left is just the pins exposed like that. So um, I will test both of these just for the sake of, you know, thoroughness, I guess, but it goes without saying that I'm not going to be using this one anytime soon. Um, it might be worth a 3D printer project, actually, to print a replica of this. I've got all the fonts and stuff I would need, so I could print a replica, and then if the guts are indeed still good, could put that uh, back inside, give it a new 5-pin DIN connector, and, you know, maybe try that just to save you know, the rest of it. I don't know if it's worth it, but uh, let's set this one aside for now and test the one that's not a Frankenstein. So here's the pinout for the plug. We've basically got a 14 volt AC connections on pin one and three, and then pin two is almost 20 volts DC, and uh, then a couple of ground pins. So it should be pretty easy to test this as long as I don't short anything. So let's test the 
AC part first, which is going to be on pins one and three. Okay, well, luckily for me, uh, I thought I had completely killed this power supply, but it turns out I had soldered my ground wire onto the unused pin instead of the ground pin. So now I've got things back together and the DC voltage isn't quite high enough. Um, it's a little bit low, but this is probably over what's needed to drive some regulators in the system. So I'm not a hundred percent sure that this is a good power supply. I think the best thing to do would be to order a replacement, but let me test this a little bit more. If it seems stable, at least I can use this while I'm waiting for a replacement to arrive. Okay, here's that second uh, Frankenstein power supply that I'm really skeptical about. And the AC line tests good, but let's go ahead and test the, the DC voltage and see what that comes up with. Yeah, that comes up with the same thing. 17.7. They're both working similarly, at least. So that tells me something. I mean, it tells me that they're either equally degraded or that's just normal for these power supplies. So yeah, I'm still not gonna use the one that's all taped up, but I think this one might be good enough at least to connect to a system and see what we get on the voltage regulators. Okay, and here are two TRS-80s. TRS-80 Model 1, as they later became known. And right away, I can see some differences. Number one, this one has obviously been taken apart. The case is, is off already. Uh, whereas this one is still uh, put together, screwed in, all that kind of stuff. But also they look like they're from different generations. This one has the, the large Radio Shack TRS-80 logo over here, whereas this one has more of the modern style TRS-80 logo and it has a number pad. Also, the keyboards are significantly different. Now, I don't know how significantly, but I know that the keys themselves, at least from what I can tell from up above, are very different. These are the smooth, what I would call the older style keys um, on this particular keyboard, more like a terminal style with the big lettering, etc., cetera, um, on them. And these feel more plasticky. There's more of a echoey ping sound that I can hear pinging around inside the unit. And uh, yeah, it feels much more like a keyboard. Uh, it's a nice keyboard. It has, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just different. If you've used these styles of keyboards, you'll know exactly what I mean. This one just feels, to me, just feels better. And I don't know, more more towards the 70s. This one is uh, feels more plasticky and more towards the 80s. This one also, in addition to some cobwebs, has a 4K level two sticker on it. So we'll get into this in a minute, but perhaps that was upgraded at some point. Uh, there's also some things rolling around inside there. So I'm a little bit worried that everything is actually included with this. And then on the back, there is a uh, sticker there. It's serial number 016434. And the uh, catalog number for this one is 26-1004, and no other stickers or labels on the back. By contrast, this one has the uh, uh, I.O. expansion interface, it says right here, actually labeled on the ribbon cable, and that's still sticking out the back. So this was definitely level two and was definitely being used with a I.O. expansion, as was this one, I assume, at some point. Um, the difference here is that... Uh, you see the catalog number is different here. It's 26-1006. So maybe this was a uh, level two from factory. And uh, the serial number is quite higher. Now I know these serial numbers, you can't read too much into them, but generally speaking, you know, 106055 is quite a bit higher than this one was. This is definitely a later board for sure. There is a sticker here that looks like this was maybe either serviced at some point or, you know, whatever, but the date on this is 101482. So quite late in the game, I think. There's also someone has etched a number on here. Maybe you can see that in the light if I hold it at just the right angle. Uh, but it says, I think it says, Cayo, C-A-Y-O or something, California something maybe. And it's, uh, there's another number on there. Looks like 101653. So yeah, I don't know if that was an asset number or maybe they changed the motherboard out at some point and that was a, a different serial number for the, I, I don't know what that is, but if you have any ideas, leave them below in the comments. 
So let's start by looking at this older model and then can make our way into the newer model. Like I said, this was already already off when I bought it because the uh, person I bought it from said that I think he had been in here trying to repair some of the uh, damage or trying to get it to work and he just didn't have time. So he wanted to sell it and give it to somebody um, who could work on it. So I, I think some work has been done. It's both a blessing and a curse. Inside here, there is a date, 11 20 so, so fairly early in the line for sure, November 20th, 1978. So if you know anything about the TRS-80, then you know that the board is kind of sandwiched here, kind of uh, folded up, if you will, and stuck in the uh, in the case here. So let's see what's flopping around back here. Oh, it's just a couple of standoffs. That's okay. Just doing an internal visual inspection now. I'm not sure I see a whole lot that uh, is super concerning to me right off the bat. So I'm not seeing, for example, you know, there's no, no leakage. I wouldn't expect these to leak. I don't think I've ever seen uh, one of these older capacitors leak, actually. I know they can, but I've just never seen it. Um, some of the smaller ones, sure, those those tend to leak, but generally not on something this old. Actually, the capacitors that seem to have come out of the, uh, you know, pre-mid-80s seem to be pretty good, but we'll test those. I do have replacements if needed, but I'm not seeing any leakage on the board. Most of these chips are soldered directly, except for the, what I assume is the memory up here. And uh, there's one chip here that is in a socket. So probably that one was replaced at some point. Otherwise, you know, we've got, uh, I'm guessing that's the Z80. This area over here is where that uh, socketed chip was. And I'm not even seeing any rework. So maybe that was done at the factory. Either that or someone did a really good job reworking that when they added the socket. And the standard wires here that run across the board, um, you know, they're pretty flimsy casing. So I would be worried perhaps about, you know, a wire, you know, getting stuck on a pin or something like that or and shorting out perhaps. But these all look okay. They're all still attached and uh, I'll just have to be careful of those so they don't get pressed in to the pins, the back of the, the pins on these sockets and things. But so far, everything's looking really good. Now, you may have noticed on this board that there's no chip in this particular socket. It's empty. And in this case, that is completely normal. Um, the original version, if you had level one basic, the original version of this would have had two ROM chips here in Z33 and Z34. Interesting that they use Z for these instead of U that I'm used to on uh, more modern or other systems. Uh, but yeah, so there's usually uh, two ROM chips here. But when you add the uh, level two expansion or upgrade to level two basic, then you take the chip out of Z34, add this ribbon cable in, and that's what comes over to this side of the board here. And level two basic is in these three uh, EPROM or PROMs, I should say. I don't, they're not EPROMs. So yeah, these three PROMs uh, contain level two. And there's another date code on here, 1978 Tandy Corporation. One other thing I just noticed is right here, you can see where this particular uh, strip from this, uh, I don't know what you call this, strip strip wire uh, that often breaks and fails on these. Um, you can see right here that it's coming off. There's at least one lead that's come off. And so, yeah, I'll probably be toning all of these out to make sure that they're all making good connections. Of course, this cable here just kind of goes over to the keyboard side over here. So there's other replacement methods for, for getting rid of this cable altogether. And I might do that, especially if I find that this is disconnected, because obviously if it is, if there's problems with this cable or, or uh, bad continuity here, the keyboard won't work. Okay, so I've just been spending a little time with this board just to make sure there are no shorts and I can't find any. Uh, looks like I've got good connection between the voltage rails and things like the CPU. Uh, I even checked these large capacitors in circuit, which isn't the most reliable way, but these big ones should read fairly well. This is a 10,000 microfarad capacitor at 16 volts, and it comes out as 11,900 and something. So, you know, that's within tolerance. That's what, 10% or so, or 20%. It's probably a 20% cap. Uh, in terms of tolerances. So a little high, but I, I think it's probably fine. And then this other big blue one here is a, a 2200 microfarad, 35 volt. Takes a little bit to charge up, so you can test these things. And like I said, in circuit's not the best, but boy, that's almost bang on. 
26, 25 microfarads. Um, so yeah, I can't complain about that cap. Without any other physical signs of damage or problems except for the keyboard, which I don't expect to work. But let's just go ahead and power this thing up and see if there's anything that comes up on the screen. And even if not, at least I'll be able to check the voltages and make sure that they're showing up okay. So, and I also marked the power connector because I'm flipping this board up and down. It is marked or labeled on the back here on this plastic uh, bezel, but um, from this direction, I can't see it. So I just put a little silver uh, Sharpie mark there so that I know that this is always power, no matter which way I turn it. But from this angle, it's certainly easier to see that way. Fingers crossed, everybody. Let's hit the power switch and see what happens. Okay. Well, we definitely got a video signal here, um, or we did have. Let me turn it off and on again. For a second, I definitely saw a signal on the screen, not a not a picture, no text or anything, but I saw I saw that there was a signal going to the uh, the monitor here. Oh, and look at that! Now we're getting some some text. Is this thing actually working? Whoops! Now it's gone. Okay, so something's happening intermittently. Oh, look, 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 look. Oh, so yeah, there's a pro, it does come on and you can see there's uh there's text on the screen. It's not the right text, but it's text. So there's, there's some issues. I think there's some video problems and something's not quite working right. I do want to just test these voltages real quick. So let's see, this should be ground. I think this should be 12 volts. And it is 12.63, that looks good. And I think this should be five volts. No, five volts is low, 4.02, that could be part of the problem. Now before I adjust the uh, the voltage pot here, I just went ahead and disconnected the monitor. Now we know the monitor is working, but I disconnected the monitor because there is five volts going off to the monitor. So I just wanted to eliminate that. So let's see what the voltage is, the five volt voltage without the monitor attached. Okay, it's the same, 4.02. Okay, so according to the service manual, I can just simply, uh, simply adjust R5 here to get the voltage up. Ooh, it's going down. This might be a sticky pot. Uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and hit this with deoxid. I don't like those noises I'm hearing from somewhere in here. It's, uh, I don't think there's a speaker, so it's odd that I'm hearing any noises at all. Okay, I also put the keyboard over here so it's accessible number one and number two would avoid any shorts again i'm a little bit a little bit wary of those noises i was hearing although that plastic tube that runs that connects these wires uh under the board was preventing this from coming in contact with the board but just for safety much better to put it this way okay let's see if that deoxid makes any difference still at 4.3 so it's still too low Okay, well, I'm going to call that good, 5.04. Let's go ahead and reset this and see what happens. Oh, this is looking good. This is looking good. Oh, and it's gone. Weird. Okay, memory size. Almost looks like 64K. That can't be right. Uh, syntax error, ready, 49664. So that's what I'm getting right now. Um, nothing that I can see on the keyboard, and then we just lose video altogether. So um, at least that gives me a good state. I mean, that's a really good sign that I'm getting anything at all out of the... Uh, uh, out of the system. So it's partially working actually, even though it looked like it was in shambles. So definitely going to have to do a little bit more work on this. So that'll be in uh, part two. Ooh, look how long those screws are. They have to go all the way through to the other side. Man, those are going to be hard to lose, hopefully. And I guess it's got to be done. We've got to break the seal that voids our service warranty. Should be in here somewhere. Here it goes. Can't go back. Can't go back now. Can't take it back to Radio Shack. Oh, man. That must have been great. Those you could just take this thing into your local Radio Shack, and now they're 
few and far between. There's still a few stores around, I think. But uh, I think those were the independent ones or something like that. The little cover off. Ooh, and look at this. 16K level two, baby. Nice. Hiding that sticker under there. So we've got a 16K system. Yeah, and this keyboard is completely different. And it's got this metal standoff here instead of just the spacers. Okay, these spacers all had a little bit of glue still on them. It was still intact, but a little twisting got those off in much better shape than the uh, the older system, that's for sure. And look at that. This is labeled as an Alps keyboard. So for all those Alps fanboys out there. And even though that other uh, uh, computer number one, the older one, was in good shape, this one's in even better shape. Um, I mean, obviously, according to that sticker, it was either serviced or maybe they put that sticker on when it was sold. But I could it is it possible that I'm the first one to get in this machine? I mean, there is no dust or anything. We've got the two ROMs here. Uh, Z80 looks like it's in good condition. The pins are a little corroded, but not much, not bad at all. And all of these chips are labeled just like the with the year we saw before. They're all labeled mid. 1980. So here's the 17th week, 1980, 23rd week, 1980. So uh, yeah, even the power regulator, 26th week, 1980. So yeah, this is looking good. Let's, uh, I'm not seeing anything of concern right now. No, nothing on at all on this board is concerning me. So I'm going to do the same thing I did with the last one. The first thing I'm going to do is check for shorts. I'm attached to ground there. This is the 12 volt line. Oops. Looks good. The uh, the five volt rail, which is over here, no shorts, and the negative five volts, no shorts. Ground on the Z80 should be over here somewhere. Yep, there it is. And if I switch over to five volts, I should have five volts directly across from where ground was. Yep, and we do. Good, good, good. So everything is looking really good. Let's go ahead and do that same capacitor test, although I can almost guarantee that these big caps are fine, but what the heck, why not? A little high, but um, you know, it's not too far out of, uh, out of spec, so I think it's okay. We'll find out in a minute because I think we can just plug this in and uh, give it a whirl. Okay, fingers crossed. Is this gonna actually power up and work? <laughs> Look at that. It's got memory size right there. Came up immediately. Before I do anything else, I am just going to check the, uh, the power rails and see how we're doing here. 12 volts should be here. 11.73. A little low, but not too bad. And then 5 volt rail. 4.9 again. Not bad at all. And negative 5 volts. We're getting... Just about right on the money, negative five volts. So this thing is working, wow. I just realized that you all, you all couldn't see that because I was still focused down here. But yeah, so far so good. It looks like everything's working. We've got a red LED even, imagine that. But uh, yeah, mem size, it's looking for memory. Let's see if the keyboard works. Level two basic ready. Wow, this is awesome. So fully, didn't have to do anything to this. It is fully working now. Of course, I'm not sure about the expansion units. I've got two of those to test, but this unit right now is working. There's nothing wrong with it. So I got really lucky with all three monitors working, really lucky that this is working, but that computer number one, the older one, definitely needs some work. So let's just see if we can do the old 10 print. There we go. That's weird. I had uh, I had 20 go to 10 and it would not actually, it gave me an unlisted error. Like it couldn't find line 10 or something. That's okay. I retyped line 20 and now it's working. So maybe I typed some sort of invisible character. Who knows? But uh, yeah, this thing is working. It looks great on this monitor. So no complaints whatsoever. So now I have a, a known good working system. I will come back and troubleshoot that first system, which is not working, and I will test the expansion systems and the disk systems in an upcoming video. I'll probably 
uh, come back with another video next week and then in two weeks time that'll give me plenty of time to do my research hopefully on this system and getting the expansion um, uh, unit working and all that kind of stuff and then I'll come back with another video and that'll help split things up a little bit. So not bad for my first uh, foyer into the TRS-80 Model 1 here. I'm pretty excited about it. I've got some other videos that I've did in the past for Septandi, a lot of color computer videos. I'll link those in a playlist up above. So you can click on those and find me over there. And before I leave, quick shout out to all my patrons. Thanks for supporting the channel and we'll see you all next time. End of line.